options. Oi, Luke. Excellent. Also, yes, make sure, have some more of your cocktail. Are you excited to be here in Fort Macquarie? I am very excited. Drink a bit more of your cocktail. You'll have a lot of fun. Yeah. Nathan, I've heard you have been looking into this com- company very, very <laughs> well, and I actually oh. thought it was very interesting myself. It's a very yeah, random one. It is. Tell me about it. Okay, so um, this company's called Roku. Who here has heard of Roku? Anyone? I've heard of it. Everyone. Okay, Don't know cool. anything about it. About oh, two days ago. Good. All right. Okay, so um, Roku's pretty cool. Um, they're on the New York Stock Exchange, and you can purchase them. Uh, shares in their company and so it was founded by a guy named Anthony Wood who's worth somewhere around four billion dollars and he holds 13 and a half percent in the company so when I'm looking at a company uh, the CEO ownership and whether or not he founded the company is pretty important to me he's both founded the company CEOs um, the company and he has more than 10 percent stake in the company so that's a good start he, he's got skin in the game you could say they're your three favorite indicators sure um, that's only because I don't understand anything else. Yes, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Roku has been around for 19 years and it was launched um, in 2002. And so it's been around for a while. Roku means six in Japanese. And the reason that uh, it's called that is because um, Wood or Anthony Wood, who started the company, it's his sixth uh, major company endeavor. And so he called it Roku. That's a lot of companies for one person to start. It is. I don't know the scale of the other companies. True. But for him, that was his sixth project. And so it's pretty cool. Uh, who wants to guess how many employees they have? 23. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, well, I was going to say a higher number, but Luke has just guessed a very low number. So I'm going to say <laughs> 840. 1,700. Oh, it's pretty close. <laughs> um, I, my original was 1,500 for the record. <laughs> so it was somewhere between there. Um, okay. So they're based in California. Um, and so they've got two, two um, key um, revenue metrics um, that they base everything off. So it's their platform or their software and their player or their hardware. And so what that looks like from a product perspective is on the software side of it or on the platform side of it is Roku TV, which is licensed to companies like uh, TCL, Toshiba, Hisense, and they basically partner or license their product or their software to these companies um, and they provide all of the um, streaming platform interface software to be able to view you know your Netflix and your Amazon video and your YouTube and any, all these other apps right so they provide that service which is kind of cool um, Roku also have their own channel that they provide on these TVs and on that channel, they also stream ads. And so they have a small portion of their revenue, which is ad-based. Um, and so that's the software side of it. In regards to the hardware, they also um, have a bunch of players or like um, Roku TV devices. And so these are, for example, Roku Express, which is $40 uh, Australian. Uh, and then Roku Premiere, $60 Australian. With the Premiere, you get 4K. Um, Roku streaming stick that's 4k um, and it's $85 how many people do you think would be interested in the 4k option as opposed to a normal HD because it doesn't seem like a huge deal anymore just the difference between 1080 and H like at 1080 HD and 4k it, it's I don't know what the here's the is. thing that I think when I listen when I think of that if I was if I had a TV that didn't that wasn't a smart TV that I wanted to buy a Roku device for, the chances of that being 4K, i.e. being new, is so low. Because how many new TVs now are not 4K, oh, sorry, are 4K, but are not smart TVs? True, yeah. So it, uh, I get, like, it's 4K, like it's cool. I, there would be uses for it. It just plugs into a HDMI jack, so you could plug it into a lot of things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's good, but um, I definitely get the point. Like, usually, like, some of their market for their hardware pieces would be your grandma who has a, you know, five-year-old TV that she's happy with, but she just wants to be able to watch something other than free-to-air TV. So you stick a, like a Roku stick in it, and then she can watch it for 85 bucks um, flat rate. They've also got a Roku stream bar, which is 4K, and it gives you the audio, and then you can stick a stub, sub on that, a wireless sub, and that's kind of cool. 
Um, so they reach USA, Canada, UK, France, Ireland, Mexico, Latin America. Nothing in Australia at the moment. Um, there's no subscription or anything like that. You just buy the product. That would be most of the reason why I haven't really heard of them, but yeah. I've kind of heard of no. them. Yeah, it's they've got like a purple logo, don't they? Uh, yes. Yeah, purple and purple and white or That's something correct. like that. Somehow I knew that. I've never seen it in Australia. I'll um I'll put a little picture like maybe around here of uh, what that looks like. Perfect. Um. And so, yeah, you can basically get the platform. There's no subscription fee. And then you can go into their um, app store and you can uh, put Spotify on there, YouTube on there, Netflix on there, whatever you want. And so it makes your TV a smart TV or it licenses their software to manufacturers' TVs to make them smart TVs. Is there nothing like this already? Uh, Roku are the, like, they're the, basically the only people who provide this. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and so for them the key operating metrics that they're judging how well the business is going on is active accounts, which is up 43% since the same time last year. Streaming hours, up 54% since the same time last year. Um, average revenue per user, uh, which has grown 20% since the same time last year. And so... Um, it seems almost to me, talking market, yes. or like a, a monopoly in yeah. a competitive market. It's almost as though it's got some of those features which aren't available elsewhere, yes. but which can someone can justify replacing it with Netflix as well. So, No, this is not a competitor for Netflix. Well, it seems a little like... No, I don't no, know, it, they provide the ability to watch Netflix. Okay, all right, all right. So it's more it's more like the hardware plugin for the for the making it a smart TV Absolutely. rather than actually Absolutely. providing a platform. Their actual oh, okay, right. Their channel to watch Roku TV yeah. is a very min like mi mi minuscule uh, yes. portion of what they okay. Because I thought is. their main their main streaming service was was that okay. No, right. All right. they're not a streaming service. Okay, okay. if anything, um, and so they're a software hardware provider which provides a platform or physical hardware to be able to access Netflix, Amazon. YouTube, okay, that's quite whatever. a smart model, yeah. Like right? That. So they're not competing with these other platforms because there's plenty of it. There's Disney Plus, there's Stan. Yeah, there's, it'd be you know, so hard to, yeah. It's, got, it's a competitive industry. Definitely. Uh, they're not net profitable, um, but that's... Classic. <laughs> 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 what is? Um, I think they'll be profitable 20, like 2023, 2024. Is that when they think they'll be profitable? Yes. Okay. And, and you believe them? Yes. Amazing. And um, the reason for that is... I think is because of marketing campaigns that they're trying to do to grow the business. They're reinvesting everything into growing their revenue, and that, that means they have a big. That's my take on negative it. net income. Yeah, um, because they yeah their operating expenses. Um, uh, I don't know what percentage, but they're not a, they're not one hundred percent of of their um, revenue. So there's a bunch of other cash that they um, they've got, they've actually got three years of cash runway as well, which is quite well, that's good. That's decent. That's decent. Yeah. Impressive. Um, so they IPO'd in 2017. It was uh, just a, just over 15 bucks US um, per share. It's currently 380. Wait, um, are you saying that you're almost like you're almost in the same category as me with your recent IPO things? 2018 is not too recent, but. We've done a lot of recent IPOs. Did I say twenty eighteen? Did you say twenty eighteen? Yeah. Well, I, I had to say twenty seventeen. Okay. Sorry. Well, still. You said twenty. It's not really as recent as some of what you've been talking about. I'm not wearing the headphones. It's confusing me a lot. Sorry. No. I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a hundred and eighty percent growth uh, in a year, and uh, in the last year up until now, and uh, seven hundred and seventy four percent growth over three years. Um, so that's Decent. almost their whole lifetime. That's pretty good. Incredible. Um, and. Uh, other than Anthony Wood, who's the CEO, there's essentially no internal ownership, which isn't awesome. There's maybe two other board members who own a very minuscule It's not one of those quantity. Silicon Valley where they, they pass out revenue for, for work. Like they pass out, sorry, they pass out share options Correct. for, for doing work. There must be no sort of share option scheme or something. Because yeah. basic, basically, Anthony Wood owns his 13.5% or whatever it is. It's almost like a startup that runs like a mature company. Totally. Um, and then probably the only other interesting um, note on this is that um, ARK Invest, in two of their investment um, portfolios, one ARKK and the other ARKW, in ARKK, it's 7% of their portfolio, which is un chunk. under Tesla. Um, and in ARKW, it's 5%. That's so a lot for a company with, like, a, um, an ETF with, like... 
40, 40 funds, totally. 50 funds. Totally. Um, so they're obviously pretty bullish on it. Um, I think they're a cool company. There's not a huge amount of other players in the space that I can see. And um, I think their most recent product is a partnership with Hisense. Um, and so they're doing, you know, licensing on their platform stuff in their TV. So I think is it's... Is that a Chinese company? I, I don't know, seems like it might be. Okay. Yeah. Speculating it's a Chinese company. <laughs> <laughs> Asterix, not Chinese. Definitely not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, and so, yeah, it's a cool company. I personally do own it. Um, have seen growth. I th- it's, to be honest, been one of the most steady um, growers in my portfolio and um, highly recommend. That's good. Yeah. Transition sound. Um. All right, so welcome back. Um, we've got Luke here, and he's a special guest. He's never been on here before, and so we appreciate you coming, Luke. We're going to go easy been on, on here before. No, no one's ever been here before. No, this is our very first guest. You're Amazing. our first guest. Is that exciting? Privileged. I think that's exciting. Very exciting. Um, okay. I'm excited. So, Luke, um, you are a business owner, sole trader, entrepreneur. and That's me. That's you. And so, uh, what's the name of your business? Eastway Carpentry. Ah, what do you do? Uh, I'm what's a carpenter. Ma- what's the main stuff you work on? Uh, currently, I work on a wide variety of carpentry jobs. Yep. But I would like to focus on uh, building decks. Yep. And kind of work on outdoor living areas. Sick. Um, <clears throat> the only difficulty with that is I'm a carpenter, not a builder. True. So. Okay, so um, you finished your apprenticeship. When? Uh, November, uh, maybe December, December 2019. Okay. And then you pretty much went straight out and decided to work for yourself? Yeah, about six months later, um, May 2020. Wow. That's a little unusual, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, people do do it fairly frequently as uh, tradesmen. Yep. A fair amount of tradesmen do work for themselves. Yep. Um, you can still subcontract on an hourly rate to yep. people and kind of have consistent work coming in yep. <clears throat> or you can do uh, many builders have like a job rate and they use the same subbies all the time to you know get the cladding done or the frame stood or whatever and can you explain the difference to us between a carpenter and a builder yeah that's good yes so a carpenter uh, can only complete carpentry work they can't supervise other trades mm-hmm. um they're there to do what they're qualified to do. Yep. Um, and they, I think the maximum amount of money that you're allowed to um, have as a contract is $20,000. Yep. You're not allowed to exceed that amount. Yep. And you're also... Um, oh, I don't even... <laughs> okay, so 20 grand... Yeah. Maximum job you can do. You can only really do the stuff you're qualified for. You can't be telling all these other trades what to do. Yeah, that's you right. can't be managing the whole situation. Uh, it's, so what I was going to say is you can't work on DA approved work without, right. without a builder's license from right. a, a supervisor. Or, that's a key thing. Or if the owner gets an owner builder license, yep. they can contract the work to you. Really? Yes. Okay. But, but um, that's a nice they will need to chase up engineered plans and yep. stuff. So they still have to have an active role in it. Yes. Okay. It's um, still a builder figure. Right. That makes sense. And so, uh, okay, so you're working for yourself now. You um, run Eastway Carpentry. Yes. And you do that yourself. That's pretty impressive. What? So would you say that most of the builders, they start as carpenters? or uh, So to become a builder, you either need to have, uh, well, to become a builder through a trade, yep. you either need your carpentry trade yep. or a builder's uh, or a bricklayer's trade. Okay. Okay. Um, but as a, I think you could go through construction management at really? uni or something like that. And you really? could have never picked up the tools and you'll be a builder well, and you can I, go and supervise. I feel like that would be frowned upon. Well, that would yes, be very frowned upon. But <laughs> I think that I've seen, yeah. if you, you need to uh, <laughs> manage DA approved work uh, to get there. So you do, you would be on site at some stage. Okay. Like you wouldn't yeah. just get it just being at uni for definitely, four years or definitely. six years or whatever. Okay. I've definitely seen some fairly useless like project management uh, students yeah. at uni because they go straight from they go straight from school go straight into project management whatever 
<laughs> and then like I and I don't know how many of them actually become builders. No, I'm actually, sure there's a lot of great project managers out there. Yeah, great project managers. But we love project managers. There's also great I mean, project actually, managers. Actually, they're some of my favorite people. Definitely, yeah. definitely. But at the end of the day, um, they're not they're not required to be skillful tradesmen. Totally. They need to answer the phone and logistics and you know organize ordering. times yep. and stuff. Um, it's good. And the layperson knows what looks good and what looks bad if they walk onto site. Like generally, they'll have a rough idea yeah. about and like, hey, this door frame is missing. Time, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it won't take that long for them to learn yeah, a yeah. few basic things that are always missing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, all right. So you're at, at the moment in the midst of becoming a builder. Okay. So is that right? To become a builder, you need a trade. You've got that? Yep. I've okay. got the trade. Yep. Uh, two years of uh, DA approved work that yep. you're supervising. Okay. Under, under a builder. Mm. Right. So working for myself, uh, if I find a builder that needs help on a job or something because yep. they're too busy, yep. um, they could leave me to kind okay. of supervise the job. And then that could be your experience. But it's still under their builder's license yeah, totally. and all that. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm heading towards. Okay. So when would ideally you become a builder? What would be the ideal time frame? Well, the other thing I need is my Cert 4, which oh. I'm currently doing at TAFE. Really? It's an 18-month course at TAFE. Yep. How far through are you there? I am 12 months through. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. So, well, it's good, but you definitely, the hardest part of this is to get finances that you need for it. And What do you need for it? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. What would you speculate that you might need for well, it? Well, I know that um, you can become a build a licensed builder, and mm-hmm. then you just need to um, have an assessment from a bank to get your homeowner's warranty. And ah. your homeowner's warranty, most I think a lot of the builders I've spoken to go for about five hundred thousand okay. uh, dollars straight off the bat, okay. and then they'll kind of build up. So they're restricted to doing five hundred thousand dollars worth of yep. work. Okay, but obviously, like big developers and stuff, need a lot more. Totally, <laughs> you got to work towards it. Yeah. Okay. Another, another risk, I would say, is um, your personal assets are on the line uh, until you have a lot of money. So to get home homeowner's warranty, and I should say Isaac works for a bank here, so maybe he would give us some insight. Maybe. To get maybe to get homeowner's warranty, do you need to own a home? I don't know. Okay. Ask Isaac. What do you reckon, Isaac? So there's a level of lender's mortgage insurance which like covers off like a bit of that kind of thing homeowner's warranty is definitely a bit different but i don't know a lot of the legals that go behind that i know that there's okay. there's like a lot of different uh sections that you can kind of cover and a lot of and obviously you need certain like you need certain development uh insurances and all that kind of yeah. thing to do so so there's definitely one there's one that i've heard of in charlestown mm. someone that i know went and put a deposit down on a unit yep. and then the developer went bankrupt. Okay. So they put down, I think they put down a $45,000 deposit for, tw- and this is 10 years ago. Yeah. For, for, a, for a unit for in Charlestown. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. probably 300 grand, 400 grand unit. Sure. And they went and put that down, but then the developer went bankrupt yep. and a different developer went and picked up the job. And the person ah. that had the deposit completely lost their deposit. No but way. But the building was kind of half done. So the developer who picked it up definitely got a sweetheart deal. Yeah. The insurance, obviously, I mean, I guess that the person who put down the deposit would have had to have their own insurance to get that deposit back, but I'm not yep. 100% sure. Wow. It seems like they didn't have a good lawyer on side, though. Yeah. Because if they had a good lawyer when they put down the deposit, they should have been able to get their deposit back. Like okay. you, would, you would definitely think. I mean, in all fairness, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. It's true. Yeah. This is for... Um this is just for entertainment purposes. We can do a little bit of research. But, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you, what would what would be the goal? What would be the dream? Uh, ideally, I'm not 100 percent sure where I want to end up. What What should Eastway Carpentry become? Uh, well, in the near future, yeah, I'd like to have uh, build it from a sole trading company, yeah, or sole trading business yep. to something with a few guys working there, yeah. Um, and I could be a little bit off the tools, a little yep. bit more in the, you know, organizing things. Yeah. Uh, and potentially 
solely build decks. Okay, yeah. So you were saying um, that before when we were chatting. Yes. So specializing in just backyard decks rather than people's like old, whole carpentry needs. Well, so that's smart, right? right? Oh well, yeah. Whatever, whatever. Because yeah. I yeah. feel like that's like a it's a more scalable option because you can streamline the process, right? Yes. And you're not being asked to do all these random odd jobs. Yeah. Right. Correct. Is that the goal? Well, yes. And if you're always building decks, yeah, you become a lot more efficient. Even though yeah, we're qualified carpenters. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. So I guess you can you can foster relationships with suppliers. Yes. You can also specialize. You get some niche advantages with marketing. Like you can specialize in that. And you can only advertise as a deck builder. Yeah. All that kind of thing. True. And then everyone who you talk to, they talk to their friends, and you get that referral level of marketing. Okay. So if you were just doing decks, yeah. Um, how would you market that? So I, what you're saying is true. Um, niche marketing, from our experience, marketing to just a general. Um, group of people doesn't is fairly ineffective, but marketing to something a little more niche where the product suits that particular people group um, is much more effective. And so, if what you're saying makes a lot of sense, it's more efficient. You can you know have better relationships with your suppliers, your guys who are working there every day know what they're doing. They're confident. It's easy. Yep. But even from a marketing perspective, true, you're in a little bit of a strip uh, like a, a slipstream as well. Yeah. So uh, how do we have any ideas of how you might market that? Well, I, I am not great at marketing, and yeah, I'm not. What have great you tried? What have you tried? Tell us. I've it doesn't matter. Just put. Uh, I've got a friend of mine who's a photographer. Yep. And he took a few photos of a few jobs I've done. Yep, that's a good idea. Um, and then I just put them on social media. Okay, and like um, boosted and the post or something. Yeah, and boosted the post. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I think I got one job out of this. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, not a huge job, but something. definitely like. Okay. I'm interested to I know. Did it cover it. the cost of the marketing expense? Definitely. Definitely covered really? it. Hundred okay. percent. Yeah, okay. Okay. Cool. What did you spend on the marketing boost? Uh, Approximately. I'd say, hundred dollars. Okay. Hundred and twenty. Yeah, and the jobs. Something. The job would have been a couple of grand, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just to confirm. Six, seven grand. Job. And just to confirm, a boost is not a specified. You don't put in a demographic or anything like that. You True. just chuck a boost on. It's a general I boost. Just, I didn't choose an age group and an area. Age group and area. Because as okay. a carpenter, I'm not going to... Well, as a small sole trader, hey, you're not I can't build a, a deck year old. in Queensland. No. Yeah. But the only options it gave me were age group and area. Yeah, okay. so it's nothing like Facebook Ads Center, which lets yeah. you choose a lot of yep. um, specific demographics. Yep. Now, I'm interested in this because we were talking about it earlier, uh, Luke. We were talking about marketing options for carpentry. I had a okay. couple of random ideas that All I right. spitballed. What's an idea? Luke. Give us it. So here's, here's, here's like I haven't my, heard these. Here's my very first one. Well, my very first one was literally... We grab a specific demographic. So it's very similar to uh, a marketing campaign that we've tried before. So this is digital marketing? Digital marketing. So I went digital marketing. I had maybe three. I think I had three ideas that I presented earlier just in like a random brainstorm. And one yeah. of them was Facebook marketing. And then, yeah, obviously you pick a different set of... You, set, you pick a different couple of pictures of decks that you've done. Yeah. Maybe... So maybe you go before and after pics. Oh, yeah. Some people That's effective. like before and after yep. and then you would market that I think you would market that more maybe towards maybe after and before yeah that's, yeah, that's maybe what that. I've been doing because nobody wants an ugly picture to start with no. true true but true. they do want to see what it's come from yeah. but you've also got to remember that on Instagram you see the second photo first sometimes when you look at a, an ad uh, because it comes depends through. on how you set the preferences. True, true, true. All right, yes. And so, yeah, you can you can definitely <laughs> set you can set a rolling photo. So you on. can optimize the preferences so that the the actual photo that got the most engagement, so the most clicks, comes up first. Definitely in the carousel. But I feel like you wouldn't do that in this situation. No, no, no. So, so with that, you you look at um, no, you you definitely want to present it exactly how you want people to see it. Exactly. So with with that. You go after, before, whatever. Yep. But I feel like that specifically works with more of an older demographic. And so you might do that for 40, oh, focus to, 40 yeah. to 60. So or you something. might do that 40 to 60. But yeah. then you might also okay. grab a couple of nice, just general nice lifestyle. Maybe you have a couple of people having a drink on the deck kind of thing. Oh, yeah. You grab a couple of nice lifestyle photos, yeah. chuck those up, go 20, 26, 27, kind of very first homeowners. Yeah. And then you go 26, 27 couples, maybe. True. And then you go for a couple of... And then you go to that, to, to 40, that kind of thing. Because they like they like the lifestyle. It's more about lifestyle for them. And you're marketing the... Like, are you, are you missing a, a deck in your life? Or, yeah. you know, you're putting some sort of post on there saying, uh, 
you need this sort of lifestyle type yeah. of... Yeah, totally. I definitely. think that's a great idea. So there's, lifestyle, there's a lifestyle approach. That's good. So what you would do with each of them, though, you'd definitely do a lot of testing. So one thing I found about Facebook ads is you have to do heaps of testing to kind of work out what really works. Absolutely. So you gotta you got to test the lifestyle versus the before and after. Yep. And then you could even go for the older lifestyle. You get some older people reading a book and sitting in a nice chair on, on your deck kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. So you could also try that. Try it with a bunch of different age groups and a bunch of different demographics and, and maybe couples. Maybe couples would work better, couples with young families, that kind of thing. Yep. And then, you know, you might target a younger couple, 25 to 35. Couple 35, to 35 max, <laughs> right? And then you might also target 55 to 70 because they might want to be like, to, maybe those will work best. I don't know. One thing I was talking about with Luke as well was... So, we've talked about digital marketing. We've talked about is digital marketing. Is this also digital marketing? This isn't also digital marketing. Oh, okay. So, this one's more of a manual approach, right. and I have no idea how well it would work. Okay. And I like this because what I'm doing is... Uh, I, uh, it's only local. Yeah. It's um, only local, yeah. So, this idea is kind of cool. Okay. Yep. Tell us. Yeah. So, <laughs> my specific idea here that I presented, and Luke seemed to really like this one. Okay. It was, say a brochure or a newsletter or a mm-hmm. physical piece of something. Yeah. You go on domain or real estate or whatever yeah. and you look at and whatever kind of real estate site works and you look at all of the all of the properties which have sold recently. Yeah. And you go for the last 6 months you go find all the properties that have sold recently. Yep. Then you get someone who's just got their red peas or whatever you pay them 20 bucks an hour <laughs> to go and literally go and like hand out that you give them a list of addresses, yeah, yeah, and then you go and put that flyer in those letterboxes. Now that was inspired by. So you're putting them in letterboxes of, of houses who have recently sold. Yeah, okay. that was inspired by what you said yes. one time. You said to me one time. Okay. Tell me. Yeah. So um, my we recently sold a house in uh, Warners Bay, and uh, which is kind of like a Bay District of Newcastle, and um, put it for sale, and then within uh, mul- maybe a week of listing it for sale, signs out the front, stuff like that. Um, we get a brochure in the mail, which is what I was actually talking about, from a, a removalist company offering their services. Great brochure, a couple of great photos, a list of what you should do before your, you know, how to pack for a move, um, a list of steps to, on the day, what you should do. Like, That's sly. Yeah, so like, yeah, so they're just slipping in, you know, slipping into the DMs. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, I as soon as I got it, because I kind of have that f- frame of mind, I was like, oh my God, these guys are geniuses. It's very clever. Someone's just scrolling um, domain and they're literally just grabbing addresses of recently um, sold houses yeah. and they're just sending them this brochure because clearly they're going to they're gonna be looking for a removal list. How often do people re- like move? Like every five to 10 years, right? So yeah, they used it. They can't remember what company they used 10 years ago. So every time they're looking for a brand new company, and yeah. so it's a genius idea. So okay, this inspired your thought. Yeah, it definitely inspired my thought. And um, and What's you could thought? go, you could literally, oh, even better than the paying an hourly rate, you could literally say, I'll give you a hundred bucks for a hundred properties, and oh, then a hundred addresses. A hundred. I'll give you a hundred addresses. Yeah. And then I'll pay you a hundred bucks to go and drop these around. <laughs> And then you probably <laughs> end up. Probably a bit cheap. You yeah. probably end up. All right, whatever. I'll pay you 250 bucks. I don't know. <laughs> Depends how fast they drive. True. Yeah, they could drive really fast. They can get it done. We don't condone fast driving, though. I mean, no, I would never go past 60 in a 60 <laughs> zone. But if you know if it works, it works. You know, and uh, and I think that you could definitely make a you could definitely make a nice if you got one conversion, you're pretty much covering. You okay, know, so cost. you're taking people who've recently purchased a new property. Yeah. Who may want to make some small changes to the property to make it uh, more yeah. beneficial to their lifestyle. Yeah, so so I'd say... Is that right? Yeah, I'd, I'd write something specific to, hey, you know, welcome to... Not welcome to the neighborhood, but something <laughs> like you've yeah, just yeah. you've just got something. Yes. Yeah, and let me... You know, what about an upgrade to your backyard? Wouldn't that be nice? Have your friends around, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And show... You can definitely we, show lifestyle stuff there. Is it, well. Okay, is it worth the, the time and effort to put into physically make us just a quick mental analysis of each property on domain as to whether or not it would be suitable for them to have a brand new deck for what i'm thinking is uh, yeah you definitely look you definitely look at look? each property you okay, look so at each property because like if you're looking at a brand new property waterfront property in, in merriweather um and clearly the house is a six million dollar house yeah and doesn't need a deck yeah it's not worth 
you paying old mates time to go and deliver it. No, no, right? definitely. So what I'm saying is people with a grassy backyard yep. that looks nice, yep. that looks nice for a deck, yep. and it's got nothing on there. It's got a sliding door that goes straight to grass or yep. something like that. Yep. And it's like, oh, this could be really good. So like, you use the property listing to determine whether or not yeah, the yeah, property is suitable So you'd have for to deck. manually go through each yep. kind of listing, yep. but you'd decide from there yep. if it's worth it. I don't okay. know. Okay. How do you think this would be affordable for small businesses? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll do it Would for they? free. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so the way... Okay, okay, okay. Luke and myself had this conversation, right? Definitely. So, what if the model was... for Luke, In Luke's situation, it's he doesn't want to just throw money down the drain, right? I also yeah. don't want to sit there and do that. And Luke doesn't want to sit there and do that, right? And but that's where I come in. Isaac and myself <laughs> want to sit there and do that. Yeah. So, what if, I, what if you and I um, do the research find some potential properties that might need a deck and we do some things like send you know leaflets in the mail and whatever we think's necessary yeah the and then mail we- I forgot about that that would definitely work better than a teenager <laughs> <laughs> that's a way better system <laughs> I forgot that that existed <laughs> sorry Oz Post uh, anyone listening I'm sorry <laughs> okay um, okay so we send something in the mail to the property <laughs> So dumb. Why did I say all that stuff before? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're, we make a great partner. Yeah. We bounce off each other, right? That sounds more scalable. <laughs> it's a little more scalable. Mail system. <laughs> Forgot this is a great thing called OzPost. It's been around for 150 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, uh, okay. So then the way that we make money is what if, if we find a job uh, we put we could put a number, we could put an email address or some some way to contract, and you can easily determine whether or not that came through the service that we provided. Yep. If it did, we just take a small cut of that job. Yeah. And there's no risk to you because you're not getting any less work and you're not spending any money with no return. But if you get a return, yep. the return being a job, yep. let's say it's a ten thousand dollar job, that's a job you never you didn't have before. Yeah. And giving away five, ten. 50, 90 percent. <laughs> he wants to, he actually, I heard him say before, he wants a 95 percent commission to us and he wants to take 5 percent of the revenue. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> we can negotiate that offline. We'll, we'll but, talk about that later. The customer's going to have a 500 percent uh, increase in their price. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. All right, we'll find you, we'll market and we'll find you clients and then we'll take a percentage. We'll work out the split later. That sounds good. <laughs> okay, done. Less than 95%. Done. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, Luke, you we've established that you are a sole trader, business owner. Yes. Um, at Eastway Carpentry, and that's pretty cool. Um, you did that pretty much straight out of your apprenticeship, and props to you for that. Thank you. Um, but would you say that you're also an entrepreneur? Or aspirational entrepreneur, maybe? Yeah, let's say that. Okay. I mean... Confidence? It's good. I, I would say that I'm not quite an op- entrepreneur, but, but yeah. um, it sounds fun. Okay. No, I agree with that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> do you have uh, other ideas of things that you're interested in? Um, I like building... Uh, yep. Well, I like the thought of building a few different streams of income. Yeah. Um, not just, you yep. know, not just slaving away forever, working a single job. Yep. Or earning one business and just doing that yep um, but recently I've been it's a fresh idea but recently I've been looking into um, like drop shipping some uh, like office furniture ah. uh, just through a Shopify store it's true um, very fresh idea but uh, I mean yeah so what kind of items are we talking here uh, like desks chairs and potentially like some accessories for the desk um and then it'll probably grow well yeah no Who it's knows. good confidence so a couple I mean, of a couple of accessories so yeah, like, like led mouse lighting pad, led uh, lighting yeah. 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 mouse pad yeah. maybe mouse maybe computer you sell some fake plants but you could sell some fake yeah. little trees yeah <laughs> just pretty things pen holders you know pen holders yeah sure it's good so would you market this more towards an office worker or would it be someone who is working from home? Maybe they might like some <coughs> some kind of home stuff that they want or someone who's literally the purchasing manager for an office, something well, like that. Well, potentially both. Okay. Um, you know, market it to both audiences. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, 
at the moment with work from home from COVID, that yeah. would be a good idea potentially. It'd be a booming area, definitely. Yes. Okay, and so, then so it, you put some effort in initially. Yes. So you put in some time and some some money. Is there much? I would say. Do you think there's be, much upfront cost needed? Not a lot, but okay. um, you know, time is money. <laughs> No. One thing I've found with... In uh, your case, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. One thing I've found with Shopify stores is you often need to order a sample just to know that your product is good. Yep. So you need to order a couple to, to kind of see what you couple like. A of desks. One of the, yeah, one of the <laughs> issues with desks and chairs <laughs> is you've got to order them and then they're at your house and it's like, oh, yeah. what do I do with these four desks that I've got in my garage? I don't know. And they're more expensive than, you know, yeah, so the, a small item. The initial capital outlay required for the samples, for example, um, is more significant than testing out a mouse pad. Mm. And the samples for the samples for a desk might cost you 400, 500 bucks to, to get two or three, you know? Yep. So it might Not be to a, mention shipping. And, and then you've got to ship them from China, all that kind of... Well, wherever they're made, you know, Australia. Yeah, no assumptions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's yeah. a very good point. Um, but it's not out of the question. It definitely could be a good idea. Um, okay, interesting. So um, from what you're understanding, would this require you to purchase a large amount of an item up front and then on sell it? Or is it, do you need, are you able to purchase <coughs> as the orders come through? I have not looked into it You're not that sure. far. Okay, because just a no, fresh it's, thought. it's fine. Thoughts are good. I'm so hoping we can flesh this out that now. I do not have to ever pay for something before it's sold because that would be the issue, it's right? A very expensive on capital intensive items. Item. Comparing a mousepad to a desk, you call the desk capital intensive. Um, if you were to put, need to purchase, so okay, a lot of these um, manufacturers have minimum order quantities, right? Yeah. Of say 150 items if you need to order 150 desks at what how much is a desk have you looked into well, it well I've been looking but how much it tell ranges us. a lot tell us can't tell us how much uh, maybe tell, from for, like for $80 to you know okay. Tell us like the full conference table. Dollars. Yeah, full conference table. Yeah, I think that was about $7,000 US. $7,000. Plus another $7,000 for postage. So, okay. Hitting up we definitely 15K saw one. Okay, for a, a desk here. We were definitely exploring one for 35 k to buy the desk and then 45 k to ship to Australia. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so right. $7,000 outlay per item. If you were needing to ship that directly to a warehouse and on sale, um, the initial capital outlay would be something like a million and fifty dollars. Yeah, for one hundred and fifty items. That doesn't sound like good time. Um, so, I'd call that a high risk operation, um, unless you were pretty confident. Maybe you could get a contract to sell those desks before you order them. I'd even call it a million and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? A million and fifty dollars. <laughs> oh, did I? Sorry. Yeah, well, uh, that's all right. No one's going to be checking the math that heavily. I was just being <laughs> more of a dick than anything else. <laughs> um, okay, interesting. Okay, so you need to look into that. If you can do a model where you only need to make the purchase upon the order, then it's really viable to do higher priced items, I'd say. Yeah. Um, the, but if that's <clears> not the case, and if you need to order a large quantity up front, then maybe your accessories is a better idea? Yeah, definitely. I think Luke was more looking into uh, like Oberlo slash o Oberlo. What's that? O Oberlo, Oberlo, something like that. It's an app that runs through Shopify. Okay. So that's something Created that's... Created by Shopify. Um, uh, and probably. it links up to AliExpress. AliExpress, what's that? Uh, it's a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is that, a, Luke? It's an online platform where you can... Um, Kind of get like wholesale items, I think. From China. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's other places that they come from. So AliExpress runs through Alibaba, except <laughs> the problem with AliExpress is that you're you're not dealing. So I'm not I'm not 100 sure. You're not sure. dealing direct. I think you're dealing. I think you're dealing somewhat direct. Really. But you're definitely getting the margin taken out of yourself. So really? you're losing margin on Ali, AliExpress, AliExpress yep. rather than. Alibaba, the and you, the, the the purpose of doing that is the like you get better shipping, you yeah. get better, you get the warehousing costs yeah. like already covered that kind of thing. It's yeah. definitely more convenient to do that. 
but yeah. rather than lead but organizing. Lot, yeah. If it's less time intensive, as you alluded to before, or really specified, like being that you're a sole operator, your time is money. So if you can justify having a service like Obolo or Obolo, <laughs> we need to confirm how to say that. We'll cut the one that's wrong and we'll keep the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, if you can justify that um, by the amount of hours required to do it yourself on um, Alibaba, then it makes sense. Um, okay, so you go on, you go through a bolo, and it leads you to AliExpress. Yep. And you can select from what feels like infinite amount of items, or is it? Uh, there's a lot of stuff a lot. On there. Okay, yeah, so, so I, this is very fresh, and all I've done is really set that system up. Yeah. Uh, I've got a free Shopify trial. Ah. So nice. and then like I've a, downloaded a one month a bolo, or something. Yeah. and just gone onto AliExpress to have a look. Yeah. Uh, and I searched up office desk. Yeah. And I think 1,700 pages came up. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's so but many. like, I think about half of them were pulpits for the church. There was a church huge pulpits. amount of pulpits. Yeah, for like three okay. grand each. But anyway. Okay. So I, I... That's random. I needed to filter that a little bit better. But Okay. Okay. So then, do you know how it works? I, don't, I actually don't know how it works. So my assumption is a bolo has to take out some of the logistics. So you purchase... A product on AliExpress. Yes. Well, what you do... Do you know? You can click... So, okay. So yeah, what, if you know, tell us. current understanding, it's not great. I don't know either. But you can add it to your Shopify store without purchasing it. You just press add to store. Really? And then you personalize the title of the product and yeah. the information. Yeah. You, you could do personalize. some photos or something maybe. So, yeah, obviously, you need yeah. truthful information, but you can delete yeah. some of the... Yeah, you can make it um, nice and yeah. You know, yeah. just waffling on. Yeah. And once you've got your own domain there, no one can tell that it's uh, it's running through some weird no, back end. Right. That's correct. Yes. You can, on Shopify, you can add your own domain, which you can purchase on something like GoDaddy, and it just looks like a desk shop. Get a couple of samples, make your own video, make your own photos, yep. and then yep, you can completely sure. make it your own product. So is your current understanding, it's okay if it's wrong, because it's just our experience it thus far. It could be wrong. Is your current understanding that you can go onto AliExpress, add a product to your Shopify account, and then when a order comes through, yes. a Burlo essentially fulfills it? Uh, I believe so. Really? But I think so. Well, there, there would have to be something that I would do, but I, I haven't, I've added a product to the, my Shopify store. Yep. And I haven't made my store live or anything. I just <laughs> kept it a secret. You've just been playing around. Yeah, just playing around. No, it's good. I don't, I don't want any sales right now. No. I'm just trying to work out how it all works before yeah. my my 14 day yeah. trial's up. Yeah. You wouldn't want to sail before you actually know how to fulfill it. Like you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't have any clue. Like, <laughs> all right. that would be terrible. Interesting. All right, it's interesting. Um, all right, anything else? Well, I want to know. So Ellie, you talked about all your income streams. And like how you kind of want to build up a couple of income streams. Yeah. One thing I want to know about is the other income streams. So you were talking about a couple of income streams there. Now, uh, what's what's another one? So you've got your carpentry business, you've got your Shopify kind of thing that you kind of want to set up, and you're just in the early stages of. Give me another one of your income streams that you're really interested in. Uh, well, I have some shares. Oh. Um. Yeah. Okay, so mainly you, you in invest some US money companies. In US companies. Mainly. Okay. As a comp- as a I'd say eighty five percent of my shareholdings are US companies. Okay. As a podcast that primarily well, we talk about shares a lot. Uh, give us a couple of your top holdings and why they're kind of your favorite. Ooh. Uh, I'd say Tesla. Yep. That's uh, a good one. Top holdings as in amount invested into the company. Oh, as in like your favorite. Your favorite, like, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I like Tesla. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, Square. Yep. Yeah. Mm, that's another. I'll give you one more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's just go with Run. Uh, Sunrun. Sunrun. I like yeah, Sunrun. Let's go with them. That's one that I actually <laughs> recommended to you, I think. But uh, probably. <laughs> Are they the solar company? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen them. Yeah, I've made, I've made about 180% on really? that one. Oh, yeah. Matt, yeah. Weird flex, mate. Come yeah, on. sorry, sorry. I'll, um, I'll cut the flex out. <laughs> I want to be very modest on this podcast. <laughs> one thing that's funny about uh, this podcast is we've talked about Tesla on all... So this is episode four? Tesla always gets in it. We've Some talked sort about of Tesla yeah. for three full episodes. We're going to have to do a special next episode, I think. A Tesla special? 
I think we should at not next episode. At one point, we have to do a Tesla special okay. because you should get Elon on. We should definitely get <laughs> Elon on. That would be amazing. Uh, the richest man in the world on our podcast. Well, not after today. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. True. It dipped a bit. Maybe Jeff is back. Let's get Jeff on. Who cares about Tesla? Don't want to interview the second richest man in the world. Screw that. <laughs> um, I I like those companies, but I I don't know if Tesla's overvalued currently. Sure. Um, it's a bit scary having <laughs> a lot of money in there and it's, riding on it so much. It's in my US portfolio. It's about forty percent of the money I hold in there. Oh, really? So it's a bit scary. Wow. I would say uh, it's potentially, and feel free to comment on Apple Podcasts if this is wrong. The <laughs> or the Spotify app. Um, make sure you write a comment. But I would say potentially Tesla is the highest growing US stock of twenty twenty. If I'm wrong. Definitely re- leave a review. My really, really rudimental thought on that is that we've seen a lot of overvalued companies. We've seen the Neos and the XYZ companies who've just been hyped up. In my opinion, the difference between that and Tesla is that Tesla have a vision that will impact the world. Yeah, a lot of other companies have that. But Elon and his team also have the ability to use the capital incurred from the extremely high valuations of their stock to increase the value of their company. Yes. Whilst a lot of other companies, um, people are investing in it and it becomes overvalued and there's a lot of hype and then the company is still the same. The, The company hasn't done anything with the capital that's been invested into them. The difference between that and Tesla is Tesla have this huge audacious goal of becoming the electric vehicle that everyone drives, yes. um, solar panels on the top of everyone's houses that power everyone's house, um, all these other um, entities outside of Tesla that Elon also operates in. I, I like Tesla for a long-term holding, yeah. um, mainly because of Elon yeah. and the way he thinks. I think he might be an alien. Possibly. I think he's already got Neuralink. Yeah, it's quite quite likely. <laughs> there's no billionaire who's not who's like this. I've never seen a billionaire that's a normal person. So, oh, yeah. if you think about if you're Mark a billionaire Zuckerberg, and you're listening, no offense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But have you seen have you seen Mark Zuckerberg and him testify to Congress? Yeah. It is quite hilarious. There's a lot of memes, isn't there? Yeah, he can't quite hold a glass of water. Yeah, he's like There's pretending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ever see Jeff Bezos, he's yeah. got like he's got like a lizard neck and like an eye that points sideways, <laughs> whoa, that kind of thing. Whoa, whoa, sorry, whoa, Jeff. whoa. sorry, Jeff. Calm down. If if you're my first I listener you were to the podcast, have Elon on next week. Sorry, and if you look at Elon's hairline, <laughs> it's regrown. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's, it must be great. All right, we'll must put be it. Nice. I must like be nice. Elon. He's must made be me nice. a lot of money. Um, okay, great. So, um, on that point though, Luke <laughs> Luke mentioned that it had cost ten grand for the amount of air uh, for the amount of hair implants that Elon's had. <laughs> I don't actually know. I'm going to research that later. But how does Luke knows it cost ten grand? He well, that was a wild guess. That oh, was right. a wild. That was a wild guess. I didn't, I didn't say that. Was it I said two grand. I was like oh, a couple of hundred, maybe two grand, that kind of thing. But you never know. Hair implants. He he got the best. He obviously got the best of the best because him twenty five on this side, him forty nine forty nine at the moment uh, on this side. Let's um yeah. Let's think about that. It looks the camera's not going anymore. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. So uh, Isaac, if there's one thing you love. Would you say it's the top three things that you love? <laughs> top three things that I love. I reckon one of the top three things you love is marketing fails. Yes. One of the top three things I love is marketing, and I also love exploring the failures of it. So, I've got, I've got a couple of good ones here, okay. and I want to I show them to our brand new guest here. So, I want to know, what do you think? All right, here we go. We got, we got this one. I'll show you. I'll show you. All right, so I want to know... Just for Luke, reference, I've never seen this. Yeah, you've never seen this, but you understand this concept from something that I've talked about okay. before. Hopefully. Hopefully you remember me talking about this. Have you never... Have I, all right, you don't, I remember don't remember me remember. talking about this? No. All right, so Luke, I we've want you to... We've established I don't have a very good memory. Yes, uh, we've definitely established that before. Luke, I want you to look at this photo, and I want you to tell me what's wrong with this as a brand, and how, like, 
How would you improve it? Would you have to? All right, so here we go. Here we go. I'll just show you. I'll show you the picture. We'll have the picture up. All right, so so look at the look at the brand name. Read out the brand name for me. Uh, AIDS. AIDS. A Y D S. A Y D S. And okay. they're selling candy. They're selling a digestive candy, vitamins and minerals. Yes. They sell they sell a couple of types of. All right, so Vitamin so I want you to know. I want you to tell candy. me what's wrong with this. Uh... It reminds me of a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> yes, okay, so that's very good, that's very good. That's exactly what was wrong with it. So, in 1970, something, we're, we're fairly young here, we're 23 age max. <laughs> and, How um, old are you, Luke? 21. Luke's 21. 21. We're 23 over 21. Uh, we're, um, <laughs> we're over here. <laughs> so, that's pretty young. The photo, the photo is of a, of a candy box, which is a vitamin and mineral candy. And it's. I think it would be today if you saw something like this, it would something be something that a lot of old people would be pretty into. They would definitely see it and they would think, okay, that's a reducing pain kind of vitamin. pain reducing. Yeah, that kind of it was kind of a medical product, a little more uh, easy digestive right. uh, candy. So this was a very strong brand in the 1970s. Okay, and it it flourished hard. It made very high sales. It was it was possibly one of the most successful candy brands in that kind of time period AIDS AIDS and now right. <laughs> here's an interesting here's an interesting thing so they sold vitamin and mineral candy they sold appetite suppressant candy that's good and it turns out so in the 1980s they had good sales in the very <laughs> early 1980s and uh, by a certain year they really didn't and one thing I'd actually I actually didn't know this before I started researching this right AIDS was only a thing in the 80s. So AIDS was only discovered... What do you mean AIDS? AIDS, A-I-D-S. The sexually transmitted disease? So the sexually transmitted disease was only... How close do you want to talk to the mic, Luke? <laughs> Very close. You also need to make sure you talk in the middle. Very Otherwise it sounds central. really strange. Will do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you almost got it. Not quite. So it's only a thing in the 1980s. So as a brand, they thought, okay... Uh, AIDS, uh, has, AIDS has just been discovered sorry, as a disease. So you're saying 1970s, these guys are going hard. They're going strong, yeah. And they're loving life. But 1980s, someone decides to call a sexually transmitted disease. No, no, the, the, the sexually transmitted disease literally became a thing. Like, it wasn't a thing before that. But, it, yes. And then someone decided to name it AIDS. No, no, it was, yes, yeah, so it was already AIDS. A, so it was already AYDS. Yeah, the the I, company was already called AYDS. But the sexually and transmitted, sexually transmitted became disease became AIDS. <laughs> this company was around before the disease. Yes, it was around before the disease. Well, anyway, before the name. And then... Yeah. And then, so then what happened was they had really good sales and then the management of the company said, no, 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 the, there's a disease out now but it's clearly very, very different from what we're doing. Yeah. We're obviously doing digestive candies. We're doing appetite suppressant candies. This is different from the the disease. Yep. We have nothing to worry about. It's a little here. bit like Corona. It's a lot like Corona. My second marketing fail that I want to talk about. I want to show you this photo, and I'm going to show the photo. Here we go. And I've already explained what this is to Nathan, but this is a really interesting one. So I want you to look at this photo, and I want to explain. Ah, uh, yes. I want you to have a really quick look and say, what is wrong with this? I couldn't tell you right now. All right, so Collapsing. explain the photo to me. So tell me what's going on in the photo. Uh, it's a Starbucks ad with two cups of, like, icy stuff. Uh, and it says, collapse into cool up the top. Down the bottom it says, we proudly brew Starbucks coffee. And in the graphic with the photo, there's some green sticks coming up with some butterflies around it. And a dragonfly. All right, now this was a gigantic media circus, and I can tell already that you don't know, you don't even have a clue how it could possibly be wrong, how it could possibly be bad, right? I mean, it doesn't look that great, but... But it doesn't look great, but in... All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw your attention to below here. It says 2002. Does the ad make a little bit more sense, maybe, now that it's in 2002? That's kind of the style that you would see of an ad. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. all right, so it says Starbucks coffee. They've got some kind of new... It's sort of like a bit of a frozen frozen Coke kind of thing, but it's from Starbucks, so it's like a frozen smoothie 
frozen kind of thing. Right. Yeah. All right. Now, the problem with this ad is it was actually, it got a huge amount of backlash. They got hundreds of complaints about really? this. Yeah. And, uh, and what we can see here, there's kind of a dragon flag flying from the back of yep. the ad. Yep. We'll obviously have a picture up. Yep. And the Starbucks coffee got a huge amount of trouble for this. They had to take it down. They had to issue a formal apology because it, it reminded a lot of people of 9-11. So it's a huge issue for wow. it's a huge issue for that. No way. I would say that people are being a little bit picky. You so reckon? yes, you'd you'd say that, but not trying to be rude. No. But September 11, 2001, I think it was. Okay. The yeah, 9/11 true. happened and six months later. And there's uh there's two towers in the photo. Yeah. Two towers in the photo yep. and a dragonfly flying into them. It's almost like an aeroplane flying into two towers. True. Collapse into cool is no, almost like... I can see like it. I can see it. Collapse. They're <laughs> collapsing. Wow. And so, yeah, it's interesting what people will be offended by, but also it's almost understandable. I mean, I can kind of I can kind of see it. Listen, it could go either way. It could definitely go either way. It could be like, hey, we're just doing an ad. Calm down. But it could also be like, yeah, I lost all of my family in that. So, you know, there's, there's a difference there. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Very All right, true. so that one's a that one's a pretty interesting one. All right, and the final one. My final, uh, my final one is one that um, <laughs> is <laughs> you you can comment on. Don't look at it though. It's um it's American Airlines. Now American Airlines right. in 1981 they launched an AA pass. Okay. AA pass was for American uh, Airlines, yeah. and they launched this, and it was unlimited travel and access yeah. to the Admirals clubs. Yeah. And so they, and this is really, this is very niche. They actually did 66 memberships when they sold it. Wow. So they sold it 66 times. Yeah. And this gives you a, so you could either pay for a five year period yeah. or you could pay for a lifetime. Yeah. The minimum spend was $10,000 per, yeah. so the absolute cheapest thing was $10,000 a year. Yeah. But you could pay for a lifetime, which what well, didn't include that $10,000 a year thing. So. The lifetime is the unlimited package. Yeah. The unlimited pass was two hundred and fifty thousand yep. dollars in nineteen eighty one. Yeah. Which is the equivalent of seven hundred and fifty no, seven hundred seven hundred K today in USD. Yep. Which is insane. Imagine paying seven hundred K to to travel on Air American Airlines. But here's the interesting part. So there's <laughs> there's a couple of the passes, so the sixty six that were issued. A fair few of them, I think, uh, I'm not 100% sure on the exact number, but a fair few of them are costing the company a million dollars annually because that's how much these people pay. I know that I think Michael Dell is his name, the guy that started Dell. He's the he's one of the huge. Really? He's one of the biggest users. He uh, owns a AA pass. An AA pass, yeah. So, what? And <laughs> so the AA pass, it's costing. I was aware of these. Yeah. Okay, this is cool. So this is this is one of the big marketing fails. So they were like, yeah, sweet, we'll we'll get people on. Yeah. And they'll be able to work it out. Obviously, the people that are buying these passes are very smart kind of business people. Yeah. They travel a lot. Yeah. And they travel first class. Yeah, absolutely. And they use the of Admiral's course. Club. They probably get free drinks at oh, the club. Absolutely. All that kind of stuff. Totally. Get the champagne on the first class. Definitely. Why? Oh. That kind of thing. Yeah. Take the whole family with them. Take their business partners, Everything. all that kind of stuff. Everyone. And so, so it's costing a million dollars annually for some of those users. Wow. And they paid the equivalent of 700k for a lifetime pass, which means 15 years of a million dollars annually, and you paid 700k for it. That's, That's a pretty big loss. Pretty smart. Yeah. yeah. So there's a huge loss there. They've On obviously they obviously half the customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was that was a really funny uh, marketing fail, and. Uh, that's all I have to say for now, wow. but... Well, I mean, Luke and uh, Isaac, uh, it's, it's good to be here today. Uh, thanks for joining us today on HQLA. Uh, Luke, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, and, uh, listen, text this podcast to three of your friends for your crush to actually like you back. It's been HQ. good.